Welcome to this discussion of the solo model, where we're going to build on previous discussions where we built a basic solo model and characterized it with equations and graphs, and then we added population growth, or really labor force growth, and we're going to modify it now to have one more tweak to make it more realistic. So we'll start by noting the problem this tweak is meant to fix. The problem is that in the solo model we've had so far, it converges to a steady state, and in that steady state there's no growth in little y, which is output per worker. And if you look at data for the US or pretty much any other country, you'll see that that's not true at all. In most countries, despite having lots and lots of capital in many of these countries, and presumably reaching some sort of steady state, they continue to have growth in output per worker. Um, and that's reflected in growing wages and growing incomes. In the US, uh, output per worker has grown at about two-ish, two to three percent per year for quite a while. So how can we adapt the model to fit with this basic fa fact pattern? How can we adapt the model so that even in the steady state, there continues to be growth in output per worker? There's several ways to do this, um, some of which are quite complex. Um, so we're going to focus on the simplest way to do it. And the simplest way is to modify the production function. Before we had y equals f of k and l, and what we're going to do is we're going to add in what's called labor augmenting technology, which you can see in the title up at the top. And the way labor augmenting technology works is that this new technology allows labor to have some, if, some level of efficiency. So instead of L, we're going to have E times L, where E stands for the efficiency of labor, and then we call EL the effective amount of labor. Now, if you take this quite literally, what it says is that a basic laborer with efficiency of 1, so it would be 1 times L, that's just your basic L, has, say, two arms, and then they can type it one keyboard at a time. And if your efficiency doubled, it's as if that person can do two tasks at once. They're twice as efficient. So you could think of it as it's like you had four arms and you could type on two keyboards at once. And an efficiency of three would be like you had six arms and could type on six keyboards at once. And that's kind of ridiculous. That's not really what the model's meant to say. What we're really trying to capture is how when we think of better ways to do things like using an assembly line, you could have the same number of laborers but they're working much more efficiently with this better process, so they're producing as much as, say, three pe a three-person team with an assembly line could do the work of six people without one. Or a person who has good computer programs to work with or knows how to program could do things two or three times as fast as they used to because instead of doing things by hand, calculations by hand, they would automate them with the computer. So that's what we're trying to capture. And then the way we're going to make uh, output per worker continuously grow in the long run is to say that this E, this efficiency, is exogenous and it grows at rate G. Now you might say, isn't that kind of, you know, unsatisfying as an answer? Don't we want to actually, isn't the point to explain why E grows, why people get more efficient, and why maybe at some points in history E has grown fast and at other points it has grown, grown slowly? And I'd say, yes, that's exactly right, but that's a topic for a more advanced course. For our basic model, we're just going to have to let this labor augmenting techno uh, technology grow for some exogenous reason. So let's see how to put this now, this concept of labor augmenting technology, into the model, into the nuts and bolts, and set up the equations. So the key technique is going to be that we're going to change everything about the model to be per effective worker. Before, everything was per worker, so we had little y equals y over l, and now we're going to have little y equals y over el, and little k equals k over el. So k used to represent how much capital me as a worker personally had to work with. Now it's going to represent how much capital do I have per efficiency unit. If my efficiency is 2, then my capital per efficiency unit would be half as much as um, the capital per worker for me alone. And the nice thing is, what you sort of notice about this is that growth in E is going to be a lot like growth in L. If E gets bigger, all these denominators get bigger. If L gets bigger, all these denominators get bigger. So all the equations are going to be the same, except the labor force now grows both because L grows and, in effect, it grows because E grows. So anywhere we had in a previous equation an N, we're going to now have an N plus G. That means that our delta k, our law of motion equation, our sort of modified law of motion, will be investment minus, before we'd have delta plus n times k, but now instead of n, we'll have n plus g. So we get i minus delta plus n plus g k. 
And we can use this equation to find the steady state. Remember, the steady state would be where delta k equals zero. We could also plot that graphically. We would have investment graphed like normal, and then we would graph delta plus n plus g times k, which would be a straight line like we've had in all previous iterations of the model. It would just be a straight line with a steeper slope because now we have instead of plus n, we have plus n, uh, plus, n plus g. Finally, we could think, well, the golden rule would be modified. Before, with, ju with just having population growth, it was mpk equals delta plus n, but we said we'll have to replace all the n's with n plus g. So this now becomes mpk equals delta plus n plus g. But really, all the key skills you've developed, setting up the steady state equation, drawing the graphs, shifting things around with comparative statics, finding the golden rule level of capital or savings rate, none of that really changes in terms of the operations you do and the math. You're just going to have an n plus g, some bigger number, in place of n, uh, where you'd used to have just n. So there's one last thing to talk about. Because we said the mechanics of the model don't really change, but the interpretation of the model changes. The whole point of doing this adaptation was to allow output per worker to grow in uh, the steady state. So let's talk about growth in the steady state. It sounds kind of like that doesn't even make sense as a concept. So we want to introduce this term, uh, balanced growth. And balanced growth refers to this idea that you could have many variables growing together at constant rates in a steady state. And we said that, you know, sounds kind of dumb. Isn't the whole point of a steady state that things aren't changing? And that's a, we, we oversimplified before. What happens in a steady state is that some things don't change. So specifically, little k won't be changing. The growth of little k uh, in our table will start filling out. The growth of little k will be zero. That's the definition of the steady state. k is steady. But other variables might be growing even if k isn't. So let's think about output Per, uh, per worker, or per effective worker. Well, output per effective worker is just f of k, right? We have that in, uh, we, we found in previous videos. So if little k isn't growing, then little y won't be growing. So both of these have no growth in the steady state, fitting what we had in the basic solo model. But if we start thinking about the the overall variables like L that don't represent per worker or per effective worker amounts, now things start to change. L is growing. We said it just grows exogenously at rate n, so let's put that into the table. And then if L's growing, presumably E times L will grow. Let's remind ourselves the percent change in E times L will be just the sum of the percent change in E plus L. We've used this trick quite a few times. So then we just have to ask, well, we know L is growing at rate n, and we were told at the beginning E grows exogenously at rate g. So growth in E times L will be the sum of those two growth rates, g plus n. And now if we know the growth in EL, we could think about growth in total output. Total output is just output per effective worker times the number of effective workers. So the growth in Y, the big Y, will be the growth in the little y plus the growth in E plus the growth in L. But we know little y, we said earlier in the table, isn't changing, so that's growth rate is zero. So this is just zero plus g plus n, or let's ignore the zero and just say g plus n. So now finally we could talk about what is growth in output per actual worker? Not per effective worker, but per actual worker. That's what we said at the very beginning was our problem with the basic solo model. In the very basic solo model, or even the one with population growth, uh, y over L wouldn't grow at all in the steady state. And we said that's not true at all. It actually grows at about 2-ish percent per year. So let's see if it grows and what rate it grows at in this uh, modified model. And our starting point is going to be to notice that the growth rate in Y over L is, because it's a ratio of two things, it's the growth rate of the numerator minus the growth rate of the denominator. So we just need to know what rate does Y grow at and didn't we already find that in the, the previous row? It was g plus n. And then what rate does L grow at? Well, we found that in a previous row. That was n. So the total growth rate is going to be g. So if we calibrate g in this model to be 2 or 3%, then we can make output per worker grow at 2 or 3%. And that's what actually happens in practice. So we can make the solo model much better fit the data by using a g of 0.02 or 0.03.